SRB2's modding scene is expansive beyond belief. Since the days of Final Demo, tons of creators have added to the original game's package by creating different forms of add-ons. These add-ons vary between characters, stages, new modes, all the good stuff that enhances a platforming game. However, a lot of the mods that have garnered the most attention are level packs. Level packs are exactly what they sound like. Essentially, they compile a bunch of different maps together to create a new campaign. Many of these are created by a small amount of people, usually one or two, such as the Tortured Planet and Botanic Serenity level packs. Other times, they're collaborations between numerous creators, such as the case with the newer iterations of the Mystic Realm level pack, as well as the subject of today's video, the Sugoi series. Released across 2016 to 2019, Terreal Salt's Sugoi series was meant to allow all manner of collaborators to share their passion for SRB2 map creation, not unlike the community-driven original level design collab. Sugoi's initial success and popularity led to two follow-ups, so today I'm going to be looking at all three of them. Join me as we look at the Sonic Roboblast 2 Sugoi level packs. The first installment in the series was Shut Up and Get On It, shortened to Sugoi. Sugoi's development was led by a community member known as Terreal Salt. Salt wanted to use Sugoi not as a way to compare mapping skills, but instead encourage the community to just... create maps. Not unlike the recent decision to turn the OLDC from a contest to a collab, Terreal Salt's Sugoi project was simply intended to allow people who might have been new to mapping to have a chance to finally create a map without fear of having it not be considered high quality enough. At the same time, maps for more experienced creators were fully encouraged as well. The mapping and submission process lasted from July 9th of 2016 to August of the same year, and the pack ended with 30 maps being compiled into a level pack, which was released on September 6th. Sugoi is one of the most unique level packs because it offers the player almost complete freedom in how to tackle the campaign. Most SRB2 level packs were structured similarly to the main campaign, or really, most Sonic games, where you go from zone to zone. After beating one, you travel to the next in a linear pattern. Contrasting this is Sugoi's open-endedness, which allows you to tackle the 30 maps in a much more flexible manner thanks to its design. Sugoi's 30 maps are accessed from a hub level called the Teleport Station. If you've ever participated in any of the 2.2 OLDCs, you'll be familiar with this setup because it actually debuted in the Sugoi level pack. Every level has a small platform below it, and hopping on it will allow you to choose whether to enter it or exit and choose another stage. The maps in Sugoi are set across three different rooms, containing a varying amount of them, and they can be tackled in any order. However, these rooms can only be unlocked by collecting a varying amount of emblems. The first level in Sugoi that you'll play is the same every time, as completing Retro Hill Zone Act 1 by Maximus Universal is the only way to collect the one emblem needed to unlock the first room. Let's begin with the first room, Area 1. Area 1 has the most amount of maps, with 14, and the difficulty is pretty moderate to start. As a result of this, a lot of the maps here are very simple and very short. I actually think this is one of the biggest strengths of the level pack, and it's fully intentional. Terreal Salt said it themselves in the original post about the project that the short two-month submission deadline was done to encourage shorter maps, which is good because a selection of 30 maps that were sometimes 5 plus minutes long sounds like a fucking nightmare, something that I learned while going through all the old OLDC levels. Since Area 1 is the simplest selection of stages, there's not a whole lot of super inventive ideas here. They're mostly all very simple and fun. That doesn't mean it's entirely creatively void though. The first level, at least according to the map order, is Hilltop Hunt Zone by Frez. It uses the Emerald Hunt gameplay from Knuckle Stages in Sonic Adventure 1. It's simple and short, but fun. I also liked Groggy Gale Zone by Terrell Salt. This level is real basic, but it has more of an emphasis on vertical platforming and this smog effect that looks cool. I feel inclined to bring up Skytop Zone because of this level's author, Glaber. I played SRB2 Sugoi a lot as a kid, but after making my OLDC video, I feel like I've gained an entirely new context for the level given Glaber's history in the OLDC. Honestly though, Skytop Zone is fairly good. I like the aesthetics and the open level design. It also employs use of slopes, a then fairly new feature for SRB2, which Sugoi contains some of the first maps to employ usage of, which is pretty cool. Other favorites of mine included Overgrown Castle Zone by Chow Brother, which has really good and open level design, Quartzite Crag Zone by Seven Sentinel for pretty much the same reasons, and Lilac Conservatory by Roy Curbs. I think my favorite level in this pack is Robotnik Park by Furious Fox. This level is a complete blast. Obviously, amusement park themed levels aren't unique for Sonic, but this one has solid level design, lots of fun gimmicks that make good use of the amusement park visuals, and it's fun to play. It's a little too linear for my tastes, but still a good time. Now for levels I didn't love, well, even though I like the idea behind Mystic Cheese's Jello Factory Zone Act 1, I think it's boring. Why is it boring? Well, it's because you only spend like 30 seconds in the damn factory. The level is really just a glorified switch hunt to open the door to the factory. You'd even really have to interact with the Jello that much. 
This is a concept that needed more fleshing out. I think Contaminated Water Zone by MK.exe is cool and has that neat ring draining water mechanic. Having the level end with a switch that's camouflaged on the floor is kind of a dick move though. Am I the only one who got tricked here? I hope not. Collecting four emblems grants access to the second area, where a few more unique ideas are opened up. There aren't as many maps here as there are in Area 1, but the maps included are more involved and inventive. This is also where you begin to feel how painful some of these stages can be if you decide to play a Sonic. Some of these levels are not very friendly to the blue blur. Funnily enough, this area contains some of the only boss fights in the entire level pack, besides the absolute final level. The first, Sunset Ruin Zone Act 2 by Hedgefox, is a copy-paste of the boss from Greenflower Zone Act 3 put into a new, overly spacious area. It's kind of annoying. The other is End of Time. Created and submitted by Safaros, it's a boss battle that pits you not against Robotnik or Metal Sonic, but instead, Silver the Hedgehog. Custom boss fights in SRV2 are not something I have much faith in. Boss battles against Silver, besides Sonic Generations, are something I have even less faith in. So, to see this fight be so solid is a pleasant surprise. Silver fights as you'd expect, by floating around and throwing shit at you. Thankfully, unlike the travesties that were his boss battles in Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, he can't grab you, so it's much more tolerable. Pretty fun overall. On the other hand, some of the levels here drove me nuts. Mine Maze Zone by Sluggard, whose name is shared with an official cut SRB2 stage, has some issues I just have to bring up. First of all, the ungodly amount of precise platforming that is a nightmare with Sonic. For another, the fact that much of this maze is incredibly vague. At a certain point, it kind of just feels like you're running around like a chicken with its fucking head cut off, and it gets pretty boring. The absolute worst of it, and probably the level I enjoyed the least was Sky Labyrinth Zone by Triple the Fox. The gimmick here is that you can only move by spin dashing. Wanna know why no one fucking likes Sonic Labyrinth? Play this level and you'll know why. Shockingly, many of the levels in Area 2 are pretty damn short, and the fact that there's less of them than Area 1 makes it shorter to complete. Although, the copious amount of deaths I suffered, especially in fucking Sky Labyrinth, probably helped. Area 3 is unlocked with 9 emblems and it's the smallest selection of maps. Only 4 are located here and they're easily the most difficult in the pack. Some of these levels drove me up a fucking wall to complete. Fudge Canyon by Vada Pega. You know, this level isn't too bad for the most part. I love the idea, I love the visuals, and I love the music. What brings my piss to a boil is this section. This chocolate bar area completely fucking stumped me. The jumps clearly aren't possible for Sonic, so I had no idea what the fuck I was supposed to do. I spent so fucking long here completely not knowing what to do until I found out the offensively simple solution. You have to stand on the chocolate bars and they'll launch you up. I don't see how I'm supposed to figure that out? Whoever envisioned this fucking area, I wish the worst on you. I hope your eggs are ready. I hope your hot water runs out and you have to take a lukewarm shower. I hope you trip and fall during a jog. Actually, never mind, I take back that last part, but seriously, this shit is just frustrating. Robotnik Laboratory Act 2 by Manami is another boss battle, this time pitting you against this machine in a large arena. Not much to say other than it has access to Black Robotnik's missiles. Gravity Well Zone by Golden Hog, despite its premise of being an anti-gravity level, ain't that bad either. The anti-gravity mechanics are implemented quite creatively and it's fun to get through them. Last and certainly least is Orbital Complex Zone. It was made by Nux576. It was also my least favorite level in the pack besides Sky Labyrinth. I have no issues with it being the hardest stage in the pack, but the hazards consisting solely of ungodly precise platforming with fast flying assholes following you kinda kills the fucking fun. Even though it's only 3 minutes, it's incredibly frustrating, and the only solace is the amount of extra life scattered around. Then again, that's a pretty lazy way of offsetting such cheap difficulty, isn't it? Despite some bumps, Sugoi is a very impressive effort. All the levels are unique, and you can't deny the effort put into them. There's even Chaos Emeralds, Emblems, and a few extra levels to find. The Grand Finale is unlocked after collecting 15 Emblems, and is the final level. The purple anime girl that takes the spot of final boss is someone I don't think originates from any Sonic game I've seen. This is apparently Purple Heart from Hyperdimension Neptunia. I won't ask. Pretty fun fight, though. There are also two secret levels, Kodachrome Void Zone and Grand Site 16, both made by Boint CL. Both stages are incredibly strange, which is par for the course for a level from Boint CL. Kodachrome Void is especially difficult to play, not because of any inherent issues with the design, but because of the trippy textures that hurt my eyes after a while. Ultimately, Sugoi is a very fun level pack that does exactly what it set out to do. Thankfully for the future, things promise to get better and weirder.
In December 2016, Tyreel Salt made a message board post announcing the creation of a follow-up to Sugoi. This time the prospects were a bit different. Sugoi had people creating maps over a period of about two months. This time, mappers were only given one month to create their submissions. So speed is the intent this time. Despite the shorter amount of submission time, more total maps were submitted for the second Sugoi pack, 48 maps in total were compiled, and the level pack was released July 27, 2017. The title of the level pack is Subarashi, although the name on the title screen is Oh My God, It's Joseph Joestar in Subarashi, Xmas Mode in July. Ah, see? All those Heritage for the Future videos I made weren't so out of place now, huh? Subarashi actually begins with a cutscene, following up on a cutscene from the first Sugoi. Similarly to the Sonic Dumb Venture level pack, the story is rather ridiculous and clearly not meant to be taken seriously. So, I don't take it seriously. The previously pretty drab teleporter room was replaced with a new level hub, the Joestar Mansion. It's rather expansive and the levels this time are inside of paintings a la Super Mario 64. Like with the last Sugoi pack, the various levels are inside of rooms that are locked behind emblem requirements, and just like Sugoi, only one level is available at the very beginning. Since he's featured prominently on the title screen, I'll use Knuckles for this level pack. Just like Retro Hill Zone Act 1 in Sugoi, the first level of Subarashi is very, very simple and easy. Green Flowers Zone Act 1 by Venture Sonic is short and sweet, so we move past that and unlock the first area of the mansion, the living room. The first thing to note about this level pack, just as a general note, is that there are a lot of ice levels. In fact, almost every room in the mansion has an ice level. There are three in the living room alone, and if that wasn't enough, two of them are also emerald hunting levels. I'm impartial to Holiday House Zone by Tex Dreamer and PSI Pikachu, since the emerald locations are kind of arbitrary and the level itself is really small and boxed in. The other one, Venture Sonic's Frozen Valley Zone, is also just okay. Admittedly, I think I'm just not a fan of these emerald hunt stages. The other unique stage is Bubble Tide Zone by Terreal Salt, which is a Knights level. Knights level, not much to say, but it's cool. The only other standout maps here are Green Flower Zone Act 3 by Venture Sonic, not to be confused with the similarly named first zone of the actual SRB2 campaign Green Flower Zone and Sunlit Cavern Zone by Bronzo Kip. Although they're fairly average in terms of design and are able to be completed in under a minute, I love the aesthetics for both. Also, the music for Green Flowers is really good. Like, really, really good. It's the song for Rainy Savannah from Sonic Drift 2. I have zero idea why the composers of that game went so hard on this song, but I'm here for it. In the next room, the dining room, we have the fourth and final act of Green Flowers Zone by Venture Sonic. It's a boss fight, so an appropriate end to Venture Sonic's five-stage streak in this level pack. There's another three goddamned ice levels in this room. Plastic Factory Zone by Steel T is kinda neat. The Frozen Factory aesthetics remind me of SRB2 Christmas, even if the actual level design is fairly unremarkable. Also, the music is nice. Ice Cap Zone by Chickmunk and SSG3 is also nice for the music and visuals, and Glaber's Sapphire Frost has similar appeal. Interestingly, there are actually two 2D mode stages, Puppy Loves Funky Headquarters Zone and Polluted Polis Zone by a guy. Both are... pretty average. Sorry, does it seem like I'm skimming? It's not out of a lack of interest, it's just that these first few levels are so simple that I really don't have much to say. Things do pick up quite a lot when we get to Area 3, the library. We start with a desert level, Dusty Desert Zone Act 1 by Lilac. As a level based in a pyramid, it earns its challenge mostly through a number of dastardly and sometimes unforeseeable traps. The shifting terrain makes for a fun and dynamic level, and the lava rising room is a nice touch. For the final ice level in the pack, we have Spectorius with Snow Summit Zone. This is the most standout ice level in the pack, and maybe just as a whole. Spectorius was responsible for some of the most visually striking OLDC levels, and that influence is present here in almost every aspect. With the beautiful atmospheric lightning and repurposing of textures, it really does look gorgeous. Design-wise, it's also very fun with some vertical platforming segments and pretty varied sections for how short it is. Overall, a real winner. Abandoned Airbase by ICE is a very interesting level. First of all, I love the premise. The presence of defunct airplanes helps to sell it. Layout-wise, it's a bit strange. The level is a switch hunt. You have to find two of them, and they're hidden behind loads of extra rooms to open a door. It's odd, because while I would tentatively call this level puzzle-based, the process of finding the switches isn't about solving puzzles so much as it is just going through standard platforming obstacles. It feels pretty damn stretched out if you don't know your way around, and finding that way around isn't exactintuitive. To make things worse, this level can be very long. Without foreknowledge of where to go, it can last upwards of 10 fucking minutes. And all it is is just looking for switches. With hardly any enemies or engaging obstacles, it's easy to get bored. Oh, did I say Snow Summit was the last ice level? I lied. Magma Peaks Zone, despite primarily taking place in a volcano, manages to sneak in some ice sections. For those keeping track, that's 8 ice levels in 3 areas. It's okay, but I wish there was a better balance of ice and magma, instead of one or two kind of out of place ice areas. 
Then we have Twilight Grove Zone by Nux576, a pretty lovely level. Even though it's very, very short, it shows how well great visuals and wide open layout can benefit a level as it manages to be very, very fun, especially in a speedrun. Also the dark atmosphere is really nice. Atlantis Zone by Dark Techno is a cool concept, but doesn't do much with its theme of taking place in a sunken underwater city. It feels more like a generic factory level, and more to the point, it's pretty uninteresting. The hazards are laid out in such a way that you spend most of your time running forward with little in the way of platforming. Next is the Ballroom, personally my favorite selection of levels to play. Starting off with Steaming Tower Zone, love the music. I really love this layout. With the constant use of pipes in the outdoor areas, this almost feels like a single player version of the Clock Tower Zone CTF map. Also, it's got exclusive paths for different characters, something which is unfortunately rare in these levels, understandable but still a bit of a bummer, and a lot of platforming, something I appreciate for a level that's relatively short. It's a blast. Mix it all together zone is a really cool idea. It's not the most unique concept to take a bunch of different elemental gimmicks and tie them together, but this level presents it in a cool way, with the bumping music and space background giving it a really frantic atmosphere. Very fun level. Fort Nitrate Zone is made by Fickleheart. Is it bad that I read the name as Fort Knight in the beginning? This is a level I admire more than I enjoy. The idea of needing to use bombs to send platforms flying into the air as a form of progression is really cool and gets put to use in some very fun sections. However, getting the bombs into position is a bit of a pain. Pushing the damn things is very imprecise. The amount of momentum you have when knocking into it decides how far it'll fly, which means it's very easy to overshoot and undershoot the damn thing. It doesn't work well in concept. It's still a good level though, and I appreciate the unique idea. MK.exe returns for a level that I find mislabeled, because Leaps of Faith Zone isn't full of Leaps of Faith so much as it is very precise jumps, so your leaps just have to be very accurate. You can't cheat this level with Knuckles either, since the walls are unclimbable for the most part. Continuing the trend of levels elevated by great music is Palace Peak Zone by Gaming Reloaded. I don't care for Sonic Riders Zero Gravity, but the song Sealed Ground is one of my favorite tracks from any Sonic game. The map itself is very fun to play through, both thanks to the very level design as well as its visuals. I only wish it was slightly longer so I could hear more of the music. Now by this point, you should have completed enough levels and collected enough emblems to unlock the final tower, which houses the final boss. Rest assured though, there's a lot more levels. First of all, I neglected to bring this up at the start, but Tsuburashi actually has special stages. You can find them in the lower floors of the mansion and they can be entered at any time and in any order. Thing is, you need an emerald token to access them. You can find them scattered all over stages, so once you find one, you can just jump in. The special stages are by far the most unique levels in the game, divulging from the normal SRB2 gameplay to deliver very unique experiences. One of them uses the SRB2 top-down gameplay to recreate the first level from Sonic 3D Blast, and another is a timed maze where you have to open up doors. Then there's some that don't even involve platforming, such as Sonaguri, which is a 2D side-scrolling shooter, or highly responsive to hedgehogs, which is like Breakout with a Toho skin. My favorite is the one which is literally just Minesweeper recreated in SRB2. Obviously I couldn't do it properly since I don't fucking know how to play Minesweeper, but uh, alright then. If you collect all seven emeralds and head to the final tower, you fight a secret boss with a secret ending to follow. There's also an emerald practice mode you can unlock, which allows you to do them without a token cost to practice the stages, which is good as some of them are clearly not feasible to complete on your first run. The final room of levels, oddly enough, has a higher emblem prerequisite than the final tower, which I don't really get. The levels are definitely pretty difficult, but not so much more than the final boss or the ballroom. The first level, Roasted Ravine Zone Act 1 by Lat and Spectorius, is actually really cool. Being out in the open here causes you to lose rings and eventually result in death, but avoiding it is as simple as staying in the shade. Thing is, shade isn't always going to be valuable. It's a real cool gimmick that kind of reminds me of the fight with Soul Titanian from Mega Man 04. I don't really understand the Waluigi run Mexican restaurant, but uh, whatever. There's another Knights level which is cool, and I like the visuals of Illumination Airy Zone by JM Rant, but by this point, nothing particularly stands out, and I think the ballroom is better overall in terms of stage quality. As a whole, Superashi is a substantial upgrade from its predecessor, with even more audacious levels and tons of new mechanics. I didn't even mention stuff like the gallery or the item shop. It's bigger, better, and overall, just another very high quality level pack. The third and final installment of the series is SRB2 Kimo Kawaii 3. Not Kawaii, Kawaii 3. As usual, Tyrael's salt intent was to motivate people to create maps for the purpose of including them in a level pack that would supersede even Tsuburashi in quality and volume. This time, however, development was fragmented into two parts. The first phase, the Kawaii 3 phase, was focused on regular levels, while the second phase, labeled Kimo 3, was focused on custom boss battles. These two segments were developed over the course of April and May in 2018. 
Kimo Kawaii 3 was finally released on August 17th, 2019, and actually released on the same day as 2.1.25, the final iteration of SRB2 2.1 before 2.2 was released in December of that year. So this is pretty much the final send-off to the 2.1 era of SRB2, and what a way to end it, as Kimo Kawaii 3 features, in total, 56 maps, almost double the amount that Sugoi contained. With more big bosses, crazy gimmicks, and fun levels than before, we've got a lot to unpack. Kimo Kawaii 3 is split into two sections. The initial half of the pack sets you on a mountain, upon which all the maps are scattered. While it's visually striking, I'm not crazy about this layout, since it makes keeping track of levels you've already done pretty annoying. I'll pick Tails for this pack, since I already used the other two characters in the previous ones. Certainly makes getting around this mountain a lot easier. Also, unlike the last two packs, there's no beginning level you have to complete in order to gain access to the others, giving you more leeway and flexibility when it comes to tackling the stages. Although, I guess common sense dictates we start off with the level directly in front of us, Lilac Acreage Zone by Roy Kerbs, which is presumably a follow-up to their level Lilac Conservatory from the first Sugoi level pack. It has similarly beautiful aesthetics and some nice looking nature areas to accompany the similar visuals from the conservatory. Another level I enjoyed was Verdant Valley Zone by Frez. Even though it's a bit short and has some overly vague level design, I really love how it looks, and the music is a nice touch. I think one of the biggest showcases of the extreme rise in the capabilities of the community and the improvements between updates in this level pack are the visuals. As I pointed out earlier, visuals can uplift the level quite a lot. Something like Robotnik's Fortress Zone by Swift is okay in terms of layout. It's a challenging level with pretty open level design, but what makes it so much more fun is the unique skybox and lighting as well as the music, which is actually taken from Mega Man The Wily Wars. This applies for a lot of the more enjoyable standard platforming levels in the first half of Kimo Kawaii 3, but one of the most standout things about this pack is how weird and unique the levels can get. And keep in mind, Sugoi and Tsuburashi had plenty of weird and wild levels, but the dial was turned up to 11 in Kimo Kawaii 3. You guys like Puyo Puyo? Arl Satan Bayoen Zone, Act Su by Triple the Fox. It's literally just three or four games of Puyo Puyo. Alright then. My favorite level in the pack is Mr. Triangle the Pizza Delivery Guy Mania 1.5, which reminds me of Quick Man 1 and 2, which were older OLDC levels from the 2.1 era. It's a 2D side scroller a la Mega Man. Mr. Triangle has a health bar and can use the spin dash button to fire pellets. There's two levels and a cool custom boss at the end. Two of the most unique levels in the pack were made by the same person, Lat. Dimension Disaster Zone and Doomsday Disaster Zone. While the former is a level themed after the Sonic CD special stages, the latter is a very unique stage which places you in a boss battle that I can best compare to Alf Layla Wa Layla from Sonic and the Secret Rings. It upsets me that this is the second time those maps have reminded me of that game, but thankfully since SRB2 controls like a real game, it's a lot more fun. Both of these levels are included in the second half of the pack, which definitely contains the wilder side of levels, both in visuals and level design. A perfect example of this is Acidic Alpines by Lack. It seems like a standard platforming level, with some nice custom textures, but touch one of these conspicuous grey floating balloons and... Okay then. This is then incorporated into the boss battle against an egg robo who constantly shoots out those balloons. You gotta knock him into them to make him trip, opening him up to be damaged. Boss battles are actually something that are given a lot more focus in Kimo Kawaii 3, which checks since half of the development process was dedicated to creating them specifically. The first one encountered early in the first half of the pack is Cyber Deton by TS Dude. It's a rather unique fight because you can't actually damage the boss directly. The gravity switches here will instead grant an Armageddon shield, which is the only way to harm the boss. Aurora Atoll Zone Act 3 by Tyreal Salt and 7th Sentinel, and Conflegregator by 742 miles per hour are both custom Robotnik battles which are pretty cool. Then there are the ones that take a bit more liberties. LJ Sonic by LJ Sonic is probably the single most annoying level in the pack, but simultaneously a hilarious in-joke. This boss battle functions entirely based on your coding knowledge. That's right, you need to know how to program to fight this boss. Every time you hit him, a window will pop up with code on it. Parse the code correctly and you can hurt the boss, give yourself rings, or hurt yourself and spawn enemies. If you have programming knowledge, I'm sure it's a walk in the park. If you're like me and you don't, well good fucking luck. Now to be fair to the level, if you spend enough time here, the game will eventually give you a bit of a tutorial on how to do it as well as a free shot on the boss. Still, it's pretty irritating to get stuck on a boss fight because of something like this. I guess I must be a fast learner because I was able to thankfully pick up on this pretty fast and finish the boss on my second attempt. Both halves of the pack also end with boss fights. The first is Egg Gundam, which is just a Gundam machine with Eggman's mustache. Cool fight, although the lack of rings is pretty irritating. The last level of the pack is called Long Journey's End and is a marathon of different segments of level design which ends with a battle against the true final boss fight, Shadow of Anime Eyes Sonic. Yep, after all this time, our lovable protagonist Shadow is the final boss. 
I still have no idea what's going on with this story, but the battle is neat. Kimo Kawaii 3 features extra hidden levels just like its predecessor, but no Chaos Emeralds and no hidden final battle. However, there are still a lot of features, such as a boss rush mode, a marathon mode, and a standard Puyo Puyo game for some reason. Kimo Kawaii 3 is, in my opinion, the best of the three level packs. I had a blast experiencing the overwhelming amount of creativity put into what I would consider a pretty lovingly made send-off to 2.1. It's a treat, in every way possible. Now before we end things, I wanted to discuss one more thing. In October 2020, Terreal Salt announced that they would be porting all three level packs to 2.2, the newest version of SRB2. That was almost three years ago, and the ports have not come out. The reason for this is a result of numerous features in the base game of SRB2 which would be needed for the ports to function properly, particularly in regards to multiplayer. Currently, Terreal Salt is still hard at work on the ports and I wish them the best because these level packs really do deserve to be experienced in the newest version of SRB2. Until that day comes though, I'm just happy to have experienced them. I played a lot of Sukhoi when it first came out and I never even knew there were two sequels but man am I glad I decided to try them out. Hope you guys will feel inspired to try them as well, even if it does require an outdated version of SRB2. The levels certainly warrant it. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to see more SRB2 videos and support the channel, please leave a like and comment your suggestions. If you'd like to keep up with my content, then hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Finally, as usual, have a wonderful night and take care.